You know when we're trying to get somewhere for the first time, somewhere that we've never been before, we kind of take some time to figure out how we get there. We, we don't just go off and say, oh, I'm going to just guess. I'm going to come up to these intersections. And get. We want to know. When I come to an intersection, do I go left or do I go right or do I go straight? Or, or what is it that I have to do here? And, and so we go to somebody and we ask them, hey, how do I get there? We, we figure it out ahead of time. Or we go to somebody like um, Carlita. That's who we go to, Carlita. Um, and and I, I, I didn't come up with that name, but Carlita is our GPS app, and we call her that because she leads our car. Get it? Carlita. I, okay, I know that sounds like a dad joke. I, I didn't do it. It's not me. I can't claim it. But Carlita is, our, is the one that we go to to figure out how do we get to, from point A to point B. And she can be a little bit bossy and a little bit annoying, but she's generally pretty accurate about getting us where uh, we are wanting to go. And the result is that, that we're not just wandering around aimlessly. We're not just coming up to intersections and going, oh, let's go this way. Oh, let's go that way. And finding ourselves in completely random places. Every turn has a goal. Even if I, I can't see the map and I'm wondering, Carlita, why are you making me go this way? She has a goal. She has a reason that she's doing it. It may not always be the best. I mean, she is fallible. She makes mistakes at times. But she is leading you to a destination faithfully. Likewise, God is leading history to a specific destination. We aren't just floating randomly through time, randomly choosing, do I go this way or do I go that way? And we're finding ourselves in random spots. No, God is specifically guiding history to a point. History has a flow to it. And God is not just directing us, but he's actually engaged in driving history there. And under his guidance, history will reach its final destination. And that leads us to a lot of questions, doesn't it? What will it look like when we get there? How will we know when it comes? How, how can we even be sure that we are headed to a final destination, a final end? How can I know what I need to be doing when the end comes? And even more importantly, what should I be doing now to be ready for the end? Well, these are some of the questions that we're going to end up answering as we go through the series that I'm calling Signs, as we kind of look towards the end days. And, and, and I don't know how many of you remember out there, how many of you remember the 90s, the church culture in the 90s, right? I, I was in youth group as the decade came to a close and the millennium came to a close. And, and as we got closer and closer to it, man, we got so focused on the end times, didn't we? Like, I, I feel like many of us were convinced 2000 was it. For some reason, 2001 never was going to happen. Like, maybe 2000 itself was never going to happen. And, and there was, the, oh, I mean, it was big business, right? It was, it was a huge business in the Christian church culture. I hated how, how businessy Christian culture became in the 90s. And, uh, and you got these people like and um, Left Behind series writers, right? How many of you remember Left Behind? Like every book that was being written by Christians in the late 90s was either end times or sappy love story. And sometimes it was sappy love story in, you know, during the end times. And, and, and how many of you remember going back to Left Behind what did they write? Like 17 books? And they made millions of dollars off from it. And then you had people like, you have people like D Dr. David Jeremiah who's out there hawking his books left and right and, and saying, you can join me live. You can, let's go to Jerusalem together. It's big business. And people want to hear about the end times, not just hear about it. They want to banter about it. They want to talk about it. They want to, they want to know about it. And some of the conversations can, can become more like Star Wars fan theories or, or Marvel fan theories and discussions and debates about those than actual theological discussions. And so I think it, it kind of puts many of us pastors at, you know, makes us uneasy about preaching about it because people come to this with their preconceived notions. Not only the fact that it is kind of confusing to start off with, 
So as we get going, I just want to lay out just a few premises for us as we look at this study. And the first one is this. Simply, um, I'm going to challenge you to let go of your views for just these, this series. Just, just forget for a moment that you're pre this, post that, enter thingamajigger, this thing of that, and let's just come to the Bible and let the Bible tell us. I think we can be very proud when we come to the Bible looking for end time stuff because we have figured things out. We have been taught so and so told us about this, that, and the other thing, and we know this, and that all comes together like that. And instead of doing that, let's just simply humbly come before God God's word and let it tell us what we should believe. And, and I'm, you're probably going to come out of this series believing what you believed when you came in, but let's just let the Bible speak to us and challenge us. And, and along with that, here's the reality. You and I may disagree about a few things. You know what? We might but let's hold to the essential truth, things like the fact that we know that Jesus is coming. Does, does it matter if he comes before the tribulation or after the tribulation? Uh, what's more important? The word of God is. Ultimately, Jesus' prophecies happen to be just a little bit vague about the end times. I don't know if you noticed that. There, 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 there's a little bit, it's a little bit foggy. And I think it's with wisdom that we come and say, you know what, this is what I believe. But if Jesus had wanted us to know with 100% certainty, he would have written it down. He would have drawn us a timeline for us, and he didn't do that. And so let's just come and, and, and humbly discuss this together and recognize the reality that, that let's just let the Bible speak. Number three, I want you to know that this is not specifically an end times series. This is actually a series on the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24. So I'm not going to break down the 70 weeks for you. I'm not going to pull out a chart on the seven bowls, seven seals, seven trumpets. I'm not going to break down the different parts of the beast or all that sort of stuff. We're going to look at the words of God. We're going to work at Jesus' words on the end times in the Olivet Discourse. And since we're focusing on, on Jesus' sermon on the end times, we're going to learn about the end times. And number four, I want you to know that chapters 24 and 25 of the book of Matthew make up the fifth and final discourse that Jesus gives to his followers. As such, it was important information for us to know. Jesus wanted his followers to know that the end, you know, about this stuff. And so it's not just theory. It's not just something that, that's going to happen that we can have a fun discussion about, but it's more than that. It's information that should affect the way that we live here and now in this day and age. And so let's take a look. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 24. Um, and just to break it down a little bit, today we're looking at verses 1 through 14. Then next week we're going to look at 15 through 28. Then we're going to come back in September, September 1st. We're going to look at the next passage, 29 through 35, and finish it up on the 19th. Um, verses 36 through 51, we're going to, uh, after the baptism. And so that's what we're kind of looking at, the overview. And then after that, we return to the How Church series that I told you we'd be talking about in a little bit. Now, how many of you remember last spring when we were going through this series on Jesus' life, right? We were going through this series on Jesus' life and through the book of Mark. And we came to the point where Jesus was talking about that widow who gave her two mites and how that was worth more than all the other people's giving, gifts because she gave out of her poverty. She gave out of what um, the little that she had. And, and then that was the end of Jesus' public ministry. It, that was the end of it. Well, Matthew 24 picks up right after that. Uh, Matthew 24 picks up right at that moment when Jesus is walking out of the temple never to return again. And that's where we're going to go today. We're starting in verse 1. We're going to read all the way down through verse 14. So let's pray and then let's get into the word of God. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for how you are, have given this to us so that we can know what is coming, know what is happening and so that we can be ready. And Lord, I just pray that as that is, this information has been given, this sermon was given to affect the way we live our lives here and now, <coughs> excuse me, affect the way we live our lives here and now, that we might um, live in ways that brings glory and honor to you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. 
All right, so let's take a look. We're in, in Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 1, and this is what it says. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and and what will be the sign of your coming and, and, and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now see, Jesus and and his disciples, as they were leaving the temples, Jesus makes a startling observation of what is going to happen to the temple. Now, Herod's temple was well known for its beauty throughout the ancient world. It was was well known as this really beautiful building, and I, I can't compare it to other ancient buildings that we still have around, but it was well known. And the disciples probably held some sort of national pride to it. They, they were Israelites, they were Jews, uh, and, and this temple uh, was the temple that, where they worshipped their God. And, and it was a beautiful thing. And so Jesus making the declaration that, man, this is going to be destroyed, which we know happened in, in 70 AD, um, that would have that really surprised them and so they come to him alone while they're sitting on the mount of olives they can probably look across the valley and see the temple it was standing there on the top of the mountain all this white and shining with gold and everything like that and it was built with white stones by the way and and they were looking at it and and they said jesus they asked him two questions essentially when is the destruction going to happen and and uh what is going to be the sign of your coming, your, your, the end of the age? And, and in their minds, there's no way that they could separate the destruction of the temple with the coming of his kingdom, with the issuing in of his kingdom. To, to them, those two questions really were the same question. When are you coming back? When, when is the parousia going to happen, the second coming? And so Jesus answers them in a way that intertwines those two, uh, those two questions. He talks to them not just about the destruction of the temple that was going to happen in A.D. 70, but also about the end times. And, and, it, and there's a lot of debate about this passage and, and, and how to interpret it. But the majority believe that, that the best way is that Jesus actually was teaching on both things at the same time the destruction of the temple, and the end times. And in many ways, those things are going to be similar to each other. They're going to be similar to each other. And so Jesus is, is using this almost as a dis, this destruction of the Jerusalem, almost as a description of the end times. And, and as Jesus gives this information, we begin to realize that Jesus had specific goals. He had goals for his people that uh, he was giving them goals for us as we travel through these last days and so he wants us to stay safely in his kingdom that's why he's giving us this information so let's take a look and start breaking it down we're going to start in verse four in verse four and just look at he's got three goals in this passage that make it very clear why he's giving us this information and goal number one is don't be 
deceived. Don't be deceived. Jesus' first words in this sermon are, see to it that no one leads you astray. And, and we, you know, oftentimes we're coming to a discussion on the end times and we're like, give us the good information. When are you coming? What's going to happen? What's it going to look like? All this sort of stuff. And Jesus' first words were nothing about those. It was simply, see that no one leads you astray. You see, Jesus wanted to make sure that his disciples would stay true to him and not be drawn away from following after him. And you see, in many ways, verses 4 through 14 are conveying what is happening now in the last days. It's an overview of what's going to happen prior to his coming to this current age, this period of time leading up to Jesus' return. And so these verses are describing the end times are, and, and these end times are actually the current days that we live in. We know that the Bible talks about this idea that we right now are walking in the last days, the end times. And we can see the things that are going on in verses 4 through 14 happening right now in our world. And they actually have been happening since the day that Jesus died and came back to life. And apparently one of the defining characteristics of this age is that there are going to be many people coming to claim to be Jesus Christ. They're going to they're going to claim I am Jesus Christ, come follow me. They're going to try to lead us astray. I don't know about you, but I, I've never actually encountered anybody who claimed to be Jesus Christ. There wasn't anybody who was like, "Hey, I'm Jesus, come follow me." Right? I haven't ever had that experience, but apparently there are a lot of people who claim to be Jesus. In fact, there's no less than eight people right now, and um, there's probably more than that, but only eight that I'm aware of who are claiming to be Jesus. Some who you know have compounds set up in like Siberia with thousands of people following them. There's one who uh, shot at the White House nine times back in November 2011 because he believed that President Obama was the Antichrist, and so he, it was his job to kill President Obama. One is a homeless uh, British cross-dresser who believes he can control the outcome of sporting events. And there, there's not just a lot of people alive today, but throughout history there have been hundreds maybe or more people who claim to be Christ oftentimes saying that they are the reincarnation of Christ or, or the spirit of Christ has come to rest upon them. Obviously, um, their biblical knowledge seems to be lacking a little bit as reincarnation is clearly, uh, is clearly not biblical. And some of these people, you know, it seems like they really struggled with maybe mental health issues or spiritual, uh, you know, demon possession. For example, there was a guy named Arnold Pod Potter back in the 1800s who broke away from the Mormon church claiming that he was Jesus Christ, that, that the spirit of Christ had ascended upon him, and he started calling himself Potter Christ, which is really weird, Potter Christ, and he was so convinced that he really was Jesus Christ in, you know, come back to life, that he tried to ascend to heaven by jumping off a cliff in 1872. And you know what happened? Is followers collected his body from the, the bottom of the cliff. And, you know, you got to think somebody like that was clearly deceived. But then again, there are others who are clearly lucid. For example, this Apollo Quiboloi, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, um, over in the Philippines who claims to be Jesus Christ, who says he claims he has 4 million followers in the Philippines and 2 million followers worldwide. He's clearly lucid and using this deception for his own benefit. And Jesus, somewhere around 33 AD, told us this was going to happen. These people were going to come. Don't be led astray. Don't, don't let them distract you. And not only that, not only are there going to be people who are going to try to lead you astray by claiming to be Jesus Christ, but then in verse 11, he says there's going to be false prophets that come. People who aren't claiming to be Christ, but are just going to take the truth and twist it. And there, of course, is a long history of false prophets, people who have built empires to support themselves, and people, false prophets who are active to the, this day. 
people who are taking the truth of the word and, and, and mixing it with today's beliefs, you know, people from the left to the right to people who are, are, are utilizing Christianity as, you know, a, a, a get-rich-quick type of scheme. And Jesus warns us about this. He tells us that, that this is a sad reality of this world that there are going to be people who are more interested in themselves than they are in God. They're going to be more interested in getting what they can out of this world. People who are going to deceive and be deceived. But we don't have to be deceived. It's important for us to pay attention to what is going on around us. And there are groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons where you look back to their beginnings and you can see they were clearly started by false prophets, right? The Masons, all these sort of people started by people who've taken the scripture and twisted it for their own ends. And they are just a couple of examples of these false prophets out there who are recruiting to this day, trying to lead us away from the truth of God's word. And so I'll reiterate Jesus' warning. Don't be led astray. Only Jesus can save, and only Jesus has the words of life, and only the Bible is the word of God. And Jesus has not come back in some mystical reincarnation way. He hasn't come in some secret second coming. He will return, and when he does, everybody will know. But that's, a, that's, for, that's another sermon I got coming up here pretty soon. And so Jesus' first goal was to make sure that we understood there are going to be people who try to deceive us. Don't be deceived. Don't be led astray. And second to that, he says, don't be surprised. This is really kind of connected to that first one of don't be deceived, is don't be surprised. And this goal, I think, really spoke to me as I considered our current world. You see, Jesus knew that this time, that this ta- this, these days and ages, these last days, these end days, are, are going to be marked with wars and rumors of wars and famines and, and earthquakes and catastrophes of all kinds. And it says, see that you are not alarmed, for these things have to come. And that means that not, there's, there's not any single catastrophe that is the indicator that Jesus has already come. You know, we could say, oh, there's this huge, earth, there's a huge earthquake and tsunami and it killed tens of thousands of people. That's terrible. I, I hate that that happened, that these people died. But that doesn't mean Jesus came back. There's going to be wars and famines and earthquakes and they're going to mark these, this day and age. And they have to come. Why? Because this world is broken. As long as there are broken people in this world, there's going to be wars started. As long as this world is broken, there's going to be catastrophes. And Jesus just doesn't want us to get jumpy just because there was an earthquake, just because there was a famine over there, a war that happened. You know, every generation has had people who have said, oh, the end is coming. The end is here. The end, you know, they'll pick a day and this is when the end's coming and all that sort of stuff. And, And oftentimes it's based on things like this star, and this star and then this met and this and then, and then there was a you know uh, um, you know eclipse and all that sort of stuff or or the Mayan calendar came to an end or computers can't count past 1999 right all these crazy things but then there are those who are just saying look the world is getting bad Jesus has to be coming but Jesus says that really these are just the beginnings of birth pain and birth pains is this concept that is taught throughout the Bible when talking about the end times. And, and really, um, it's a very simple concept to understand. Anybody who's given birth or, or you know, as a, a husband sat next to their wife giving birth, you know what birth pains are like. I, I don't personally know how bad they are, but I know that they come in waves and they're intensely painful for a period of time and then they relax and then they come again and then they relax and then they come again and they get more intense and more intense and they come quicker and quicker and quicker until a birth happens. Likewise, the calamities of this world experiences is going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It's going to happen. And we need to not be surprised. God has not abandoned the throne. COVID-19 uh, didn't take God by surprise. The heat dome doesn't mean that Jesus has returned. Unrest in America isn't going, it is 
going to happen. It happened in the 60s and 70s. It'll probably happen again unless we blow up America now. I mean, these things are going to happen. Kingdoms are going to rise and kingdoms are going to fall. That's what Jesus is saying. It's the, na- it's the state of this world that we live in as we draw closer and closer to the end. And so he's saying, man, don't be led astray. Don't be surprised. Lastly, he says, endure to the end. That's kind of the third goal of what he's trying to tell us. Hang on to the end. By verse 11, uh, no, uh, it's a little earlier than that, like nine, he's talking about persecution. He's talking about persecution. Some of you are going to say, oh, but he's talking about the persecution happens after the birth pains begin, but, but the word, because he says then persecution happens, but then can also mean like in that time, then, during that time. Uh, and that's really what he's saying, that, that the persecution is going to be going on in that time. And we know that's true. I mean, because the reality is Christians have been persecuted from the moment that Jesus rose from the grave. Until now. I don't have numbers to see if if there was ever a time in this world when Christians were not being persecuted somewhere. But we know right now, during this day and age, that there is persecution of Christians that are going on. We're getting more martyrs this year per year than ever before, it seems. In 2020, Open Doors claims that there are at least 4,761 men and women who were murdered for their Christian faith, murdered simply because they are followers of Jesus Christ. And, and they claim, they say, and we don't even know how accurate that is, they say, because we can't get information on these closed countries of how many Christians have been killed in there. And Jesus says that we are going to be hated by all nations. Why? Well, I'll tell you my view on it. Because Christians remind the world that God exists and we are not him. What a powerful truth. He exists, we're not, God exists, we're not God. And we Christians remind the world that there is a truth. There is a truth and it doesn't change. We remind the world that there is right and wrong and it doesn't change and we don't get to decide what right is and what wrong is because it's already been decided and ultimately because We don't serve the prince of the power of the air who rules this world. We don't serve the devil. We serve the true king. And so this persecution, according to Jesus, is going to lead to many people falling away and even betraying each other. And because of the increase of the lawlessness, uh, the love of many is going to grow cold. And, And in many ways, I see Jesus describing the very fabric of the Christian community being torn to shreds. Christians wondering who they can trust. Christians attacking each other. Christians focused on their own safety at the expense of others. And because of that, the love of many grows cold. And and that might just mean that a lot of people's love grows cold, but the love of many could actually refer to this idea of the church. The love of the church grows cold. The defining characteristic of Christians will be lost. The church will not look like the church. And instead of loving God and loving others, what's the church going to do? It's going to be focused on things like power, signs and miracles and feeling good, comfort and all that sort of stuff. And this too we have seen time and time over history. This too has been a reality of these end days that we walk up, walk in. And, and we've seen it happen. Churches who have lost their love and instead become clubs for the members or their tools for the powerful and the love of many grows cold. And, but the end result of this persecution, though, is really, I believe, the purification of the church. There's a study that came out Um, which told something that I think is really evident to a lot of people, which is the more that a nation's government supports the Christian church, the 
the, the, the less healthy that church is. And the more that the government of a country is against the Christian church, the healthier the church becomes. Even to the point where those who are persecuting the church, we see churches getting even healthier in those moments. And you see, the reality is that as persecution grows, many are going to leave. Those who are just saying, oh, I'm a Christian uh, because it's easy to say. They're going to start saying, I don't want to associate with them. And Jesus talked about these plant, these people whose roots would be, would be shallow because their, their, their mind is uh, just uh, full of rocks and their roots never got down deep into the soil. And, and when the persecution comes, they fall away from following Jesus Christ. And we're seeing that even here in America. As, as society gets uncomfortable with Christians because we as Christians won't back down on the truth. We won't back down on what the Bible says. We see that, that people are drifting away. And, and there's a reality that the evangelical church in America, evangelical Protestants now make up 9% or less of the American population. 9% or less, if you want to get a picture of that, um, the, you know, the state of New York makes up 9% of the American population, right? That's how few evangelical Protestants there are in America during this current day and age. And so Jesus tells us in verse 13 that it is only those who endure to the end who will be saved. He's saying, guys, don't, don't be surprised. Don't be led astray. Don't be surprised by, by these struggles that you're going to face. Don't, don't be led astray by these deceivers and, and endure to the end. Because it's those who endure to the end who will be saved. He's saying we have to hold the course. Trials are going to come. Life is going to get hard. Wars are going to come and go. People will try to deceive you. And even harder than that, people are going to hurt you. Some of them may even do it intentionally. Hold the course because those who endure to the end will be saved. The end of what? The end of, uh, of time? The end of our days of our life? Yes. Yes. And he says in verse 14, he finishes that, this, whole, this whole intro by saying, the good news of Jesus is going to spread around the world. Despite these hard times, despite the wars, the famines, the deceptions, the persecutions, Jesus' mission will be accomplished. His gospel will be spread. Nothing is going to stop that. And, and, and we as a church have the opportunity, as churches have the opportunity to be engaged in that mission. You know, the missionary church has historically been just, you know, engaged in that since its very creation. And it tells the world, our goal is to tell the world that Jesus loves them. Here's the reality. The end is going to come. It's coming even now. Every day, every moment, we draw closer to it. It will, it will come at a time that, that we don't know. Leading up to that time, there's going to be wars and there's going to be calamities and people are going to try to deceive us and they will claim to be the Messiah and they will teach lies and they'll persecute Christians. And these symptoms are only going to increase coming on in waves of increasing intensity. But God is waiting for all to hear the gospel. He is waiting for every person to have the chance to accept him as their savior. And that means that we have an opportunity to engage in a mission. In fact, Matthew will end his gospel on Jesus' words, calling us to go and make disciples of all nations, to be engaged in the process of reaching everybody. And so don't be deceived. Don't be surprised. Endure until the end. But it's more than just that. Jesus gave this sermon for not just so that we can sit back and just go, oh, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. I don't need to pay that close of attention. He's going to end chapter 24, and we'll talk about this more when we get there. But the last thing he wants us to do is to be alert, 
Be on our guard. Because one day, we as a nation, we as a culture, we as a, tr- as a world are going to step over the edge of the ledge. No longer we'll be walking along the ledge, along the edge of the end, but we're going to step off of it into the end. No longer will we be in the end days, but then we'll be in the end. And in that moment, here's the reality. In that moment, the only thing that's going to matter what is your relationship with God like? That's another series, another sermon, another discussion. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this truth. We thank you for this word and ask, Lord, that you would help us and just to um, bring glory to you. Lord, as we walk through this time, Father, we want to see you lifted on high. Lord, we want to have a healthy relationship with you as we walk through these last days. And Lord, guide us that we might share your love and truth with all those around us. We ask these things in your name. Amen.